Uh, kia ora, nā mihi nui ke koutou katoa. Uh, I will now hand over to Dr Bloomfield to update on case numbers and other related matters, and then we'll come back to me with a very brief comment and then your questions, aiming to, uh, in light of the House and obligations there, aiming to finish around about 22. Dr Bloomfield. Uh, thank you, Deputy Prime Minister. Kia ora koutou katoa. So today uh, we're announcing 102 new COVID cases in the community. Uh, of these 94 are in Auckland and eight of them are in the Waikato. So our total number of cases in this outbreak is now 2,260. Of today's cases, 30 are household contacts, uh, 40 are yet to be linked to a current case, although you can imagine with this number of cases, interviews on many are just getting underway or about to happen. Uh, now of yesterday's cases, uh, the 60, 20 remain unlinked at this point with investigations ongoing. But the focus, of course, is on identifying contacts and isolating and testing those contacts. Uh, today we've got 46 people in hospital, uh, our highest number in the outbreak to date. 45 of those are in hospitals across uh, Tamaki Makoto, and one is in Waikato Hospital. Uh, it's becoming uh, increasingly clear, as has been the case right through the outbreak, that COVID is internationally a disease amongst the unvaccinated, and this is certainly the pattern here. The harms of COVID-19 fall much more on those who are unimmunised. Uh, a BMJ study which was released uh, just last month based on UK data shows that of 40,000 patients hospitalised in the six months to the middle of this year in the UK, 84% of those people hospitalised had not been vaccinated, and only 3% of cases uh, in hospital were fully vaccinated. Our own figures are similar here. Uh, we still have just three of our 188 people hospitalised during this outbreak, just 1.6%, who are fully immunised. That is at least two weeks since their second vaccination. And fully immunised uh, cases make up just 4.5% of the total. So further evidence from here and also from the UK that vaccination is an excellent way to protect you, your whānau, and of course the community. Testing also remains important. Yesterday, 12,759 swabs were taken in Auckland, and uh, 26,669 tests uh, processed around the country. Every one of these tests is important for us uh, keeping uh, COVID under control. So thank you to all those involved in swabbing and processing the tests. Testing available right across Auckland uh, today again, and a reminder that anyone with symptoms, even if they are mild, and even if you have been vaccinated, uh, and in particular in New Lynn and the North Shore suburbs of, suburbs of Rosedale, Redvale and Bayswater, where the positivity rates were a bit higher over the last few days, please get tested as soon as possible. But anywhere in Tamaki Makoto, uh, please get tested and isolate until you receive your result. The eight new cases in Waikato are all around the Te Awamutu. Uh, seven have already been linked to known cases. Waikato DHB is continuing testing across the region, and uh, there were over 3,000 swabs taken yesterday. However, we would like to see higher testing numbers in and around Te Awamutu. Please get tested if you have symptoms, if you have a household member who has symptoms, or if in the course of uh, the last week or so you have travelled in and out of Te Awamutu for work uh, or for other essential um, activities. Uh, whether you have symptoms or not, please get a test. Uh, one of today's cases in Waikato uh, was a, a permitted traveller with an exemption to travel to Napier last Friday, the 15th of October. They were not a confirmed case during their travel and subsequently turned uh, positive when they returned uh, to uh, the Waikato, where they are isolating at home. Their infectious period included the time they travelled to Hawke's Bay. There were two close contacts identified, one of whom lives in Wairoa. However, both have now returned negative tests, so there's no risk of onward infection there. They will, as close contacts, of course, be kept uh, in isolation for the full 14-day period and retested on day 12. I'd like to just reiterate, there are no positive COVID-19 cases in Hawke's Bay, and thank you to those involved in this situation for their um, excellent support. Uh, the Ministry's updated guidance for allied health professionals working in settings outside of district health boards and hospitals, uh, clarifying that they can provide services under Alert Level 3, that would be in Auckland and the Waikato. 
Uh, this clarification enables roughly 2,000 allied health professionals, such as physiotherapists, chiropractors, uh, osteopaths, in Auckland, uh, to, that's just in Auckland alone, to see patients who need to be seen face-to-face -face and to provide appropriate treatment. Of course, they will be screening patients for COVID symptoms, practicing COVID-19 IPC measures, including distancing where appropriate, uh, strict protocols around um, infection control, PPE use, scanning in, and so on. Uh, they will also keep providing telehealth services where that's most appropriate. So I do want to thank our allied, our allied health professionals who've had to adapt their practice right through the course of the outbreak, and particularly in Tamaki Makoto over the last two months. Finally, it is uh, timely infection prevention control this week, uh, week this week, and I'd like to acknowledge the huge effort and dedication of our IPC professionals, especially the nurse specialists and others in the, in the health workforce. Uh, who, who strive to prevent infections. Uh, that ongoing work has been particularly front of mind during the pandemic over the last 20 months and, of course, has uh, been a lesson for all of us in the general public about what we can do to prevent infection spreading, including, and most importantly, not going out or to work or anywhere if you are unwell. Back to you, DPN. Thank you very much, uh, Dr Bloomfield. Just before I take questions, I do want to say something about uh, the case numbers. I know for people who watch the one o'clock briefing, it is something that you follow closely, and the ups and downs can be a bit of an emotional roller coaster. You will have heard from all of us who've spoken uh, uh, from here recently that we can expect to see case numbers rise. We do still want to keep them under control and we're working hard to do that and we thank Aucklanders for their cooperation in doing so and as we head towards uh, the long weekend do ask Aucklanders to continue to stick to those alert level three rules. While keeping a lid on case numbers is important to reducing hospital admissions and reducing pressure on our health system, Case numbers in and of themselves are not the only measure that we need to use going forward to assess the severity of the outbreak. It's anticipated that in the future, 95% of people who get COVID could be treated at home with appropriate community care. And indeed, in this outbreak, only a small percentage of those who've contracted the virus have ended up in hospital. The bottom line here, though, is that the vaccine is the key to keeping you, your family and your community safe. We are facing this outbreak with higher rates of vaccination than perhaps others have in other countries. We are in a strong position, but we do need to build on that and see more people be vaccinated. So today, that means that we need to look at the number of cases and do all we can to keep them under control, but also keep an eye on hospitalisations so that we're measuring the severity of the outbreak there. The safety and health of New Zealanders remains at the forefront of our mind, and it is how we will continue to focus on managing the outbreak. What plans are in place for hospitals that do get overwhelmed with COVID cases? 100 today, what, what are we going to see tomorrow? Well, again, I make the point that just because we have 100 cases today, that doesn't mean 100 people are going to hospital. In fact, far from it. Um, what we have been planning for for the whole of the outbreak is making sure that the health system can cope. New Zealand's health system is staffed by highly trained, dedicated professionals. Uh, Dr Bloomfield, who I'll turn to in a moment, um, through the Ministry of Health works with the DHBs. We've shared workforce from around the country to make sure that people can um, be given time off, to make sure we get the right speciality in the right place. Today um, we have, I think it is five, six people in ICU, so the number of people in ICU is, is, is keeping reasonably steady, and so ICU capacity um, is not an issue for us at this time. And overall, the hospitals have been planning for this. That's what they do. But Dr Bloomfield, you want to add to that? Just to, to add to that, uh, the one of the things we've been doing, obviously, for the last two months is supporting the Auckland uh, DHBs with staff coming from around the country. Uh, the hospitalisation numbers, the ICU bed use numbers, are consistent with what our modelling suggested and consistent with the case numbers. So uh, they're very much in line. Uh, and we, we, of course, would not let ourselves get to a position where our hospitals were overwhelmed. The key thing here is how we use the resource that is available in the hospitals, but also in the community through our primary care providers to look after as many people as possible outside of hospital. And Dr. Are you still confident in schools opening next week, given that surge in case numbers today? Uh, of course, it's a it's always a, a balance between um, the the uh, potential risk of infection spreading, uh, but also the other health, social, and educational needs of the students. 
Um, the, our assessment for, quite, for a while has been that it is safe to open those schools. I think a number of measures have been put in place, including um, reducing the number of students by confining it to years 11 to 13, the use of infection, you know, strict infection prevention control, mandatory use of masks. And we also know, especially in Tamaki Makaurau, Makoto, um, we've got quite good vaccination rates in our 12 to 18-year-olds, um, and so that's really encouraging as well. Uh, it will require, you know, again, one of the key things is any student who is unwell should not, or staff member should not go to school. We will keep a close eye on that through um, until uh, the end of Labor weekend and give some final advice if, if there's any change in that. And just to so add on to that, just to add on to that, we would not have taken the decision if we didn't do it on the basis of both good advice and good safety measures. And so as the, uh, the Director General has just said, um, we're making sure that infection prevention measures are front of mind for all schools. Obviously we have um, teachers being vaccinated, we want students to be vaccinated, some schools are now deciding that they want to pick that up themselves as well. All of that is positive, but we're talking here about a cohort of students between years 11 and year 13 who are coming up to some really important parts of, the, of their schooling journey, and we wanted to make sure we could facilitate that in a safe way. We don't have Year 9 and 10 students, and we certainly don't have primary school students returning at this time. So we always look at risks. We always look at the balance of making sure we get that right. Jenna. How concerned are you about the growing number of unlinked cases, and are any of today's unlinked cases in the Waikato? There was just the one that hadn't been linked yet in the Waikato, um, but I suspect as interviews take place that will, that will change. The other seven were all, were all contacts. How concerning is the, is the growing number of, of unlinked cases are you kind of reaching the point where the contact traces are starting to feel immense pressure. Can I just comment on that? Uh, it's, it's to be expected uh, and it's by virtue of uh, the nature of the outbreak and also the numbers. But again, at this point in the outbreak in Auckland, the focus is not so much on trying to link the cases. It's the, the most important information is to try and find out uh, who the contacts might be of those cases and get those people tested and isolated. And that's, that's been the focus really for the last week or two of our contact tracing efforts. The contact tracing is, is just as intensive and just as, um, as, you know, as timely as it has been right through. Can I just add one thing to that, Jenna, to that answer too, is that throughout this outbreak we've been making sure that we share the burden around public health units around New Zealand. And so um, particular um, clusters of cases have been managed by public health units outside of Auckland throughout the outbreak. And we're very conscious of the fact that the contact tracing team in Auckland are doing a great job for us. So we are spreading that load around. But as Dr Bloomfield said, what they're focused on at the moment is getting to contacts. The linking and so on is, is, is no longer the most important job that they've got. Yes, the, the, the converse argument from epidemiologists to that would be if you don't know where it's come from, you don't know if there is an undetected chain of transmission. So isn't that step just as important as finding ongoing transmission from one solo test? Well, at this point in the outbreak, uh, we, the, the, key, the key response there is, uh, is high rates of testing to continue and finding cases. You know, it, it's right from the start of the outbreak. Uh, every case, of course, is, is, is another one to add to the numbers, but we want to find the cases. Uh, likewise, the modelling that we get updated from um, Auckland every day does, uh, does look and see if there are likely to be large numbers of undetected cases in the community, and the latest modelling shows, no, it's a pretty good match. So yeah. our, our sense at the moment is we are finding uh, most of the cases out there. Do you, do you have a sense of, um, or estimates yeah. of how many more cases there could be based on the contacts, both in Waikato and Auckland, which you, you have reported before? Uh, in Auckland, it's simply too, we're too far into the outbreak now and the number's too large for us to be able to keep a track of that. In Waikato, we do know that there are, uh, all the close contacts have been identified. Um, uh, well, all the ones, the family close contacts can, have been identified. For some of the close contacts, we, um, we don't have a good indication of all, all of those, but we are using the cases to, to sort of spread the word around their networks to ask people to get tested. And it's in a way, it's good to see the testing numbers coming through, and we are identifying these cases, so that approach is working well. I'll just be clear that, you know, we, we with the Waikato um, cluster, effectively, it is much more one that we can see, that we can um, identify. We have to work through with people to make sure we're getting all of that information, but I think I distinguish the two quite significantly from here. Do you, do you have a, an, an estimate then of how many more cases there could be in the Waikato? 
Oh, well, I don't have that in front of me here today, yeah. but there undoubtedly will be more cases in the mm. Waikato because we have um, people and they have households and, and we know that that's how it spreads. But, you know, our attempt by having the measures we've got in place in the Waikato is to be able to continue to try to stamp out this outbreak and we are taking the approach we're taking because we believe we can do that. It, we'll, we'll, we'll come back to you on that. It was something we were doing earlier on with the with the smaller number of cases in Auckland, so we'll separate out the Waikato cases oh. and just see how many potential household and other close contacts just there are. Just going to come across And the conversion rate. Well, to, can I get a second? Following on from that, can you tell us how many unlinked cases there are currently in the Waikato and where they are spread? If, and if there are any active cases, I think outside of Raglan, Hamilton and Kawamutu. Yes, so uh, the eight cases from uh, yesterday were all around the Te Awa Mutu area, th seven in Te Awa Mutu, one in Kihi Kihi. Uh, seven have already been uh, are already known to be linked. The other one is being interviewed, uh, but there's a strong sense that there will be a link there. The only, uh, the only cases that I understand that yeah, have been unlinked were the two actually in Hamilton, Hamilton. from about a week ago. They're still... Uh, They've been linked through the whole genome sequencing, it's very clear, but the epidemiological link hasn't been um, able to be made yet. Jerry, if I'll let you do what would have been your other question too. I want to ask about um, how often is the wastewater testing being done around the country? Obviously, if there are more cases in Auckland, the mm. chances of it leaking out uh, because there should be more focus on that. Can you tell us how often the wastewater is being tested around the country? It varies around the country, and my understanding is there's a dashboard on the ESR website. I, I think it's the same dashboard I get that shows wastewater testing results uh, on a daily basis from around the country. Versus. Most places it's weekly, some twice weekly. Uh, I guess we're at a point in the outbreak in Auckland where probably the wastewater testing is of less use because we know it's just going to keep returning positive uh, right across the, the, the city. Um, so... It, uh, we will be increasing the frequency across the Waikato over the coming week uh, or two just to, again, identify whether there may be detections in some of those smaller uh, towns around the Waikato. And in recent days, in recent in the last week within the Waikato area, there's been you know, an, an increase in testing, uh, wastewater testing, just as there was in Northland as well. And so um, there's regular testing around the country and then we hone in on areas where we believe that we need to do even more regular testing. Is that more frequent around the country than once a week? Or? Well, it's obviously something we can look at. I, I wouldn't rule out trying to increase it. We, we take advice from the Ministry. Um, we, we, we've used wastewater testing in the way that I've just described um, throughout the, the pandemic, and um, we'll continue to use it as, as, we're, as we're asked to. There's certainly no resource constraint or anything like that around it or anything that's yeah, done. Yeah, Mr Hopkins has talked about the likelihood of it spreading around the country, and we obviously want to find it if it does as soon as possible. So. And there is regular, regular wastewater testing around the country. It's not that there's none, no, um, but no, I take no, your point. As to yeah, I take your point that you're just suggesting should we just up it everywhere. Uh, the advice that we continue to get from the ministry and others is that we should do regular testing and then focus in on hot spots. Yeah, and we're looking at it again as part of a sort of um, future testing in a highly vaccinated population, including. Uh, which tests to w w the sort of surveillance testing of the population, but also the wastewater testing, and that may well see us doing the latter more frequently uh, as part of the the, the, the um, uh, disease detection, really early detection um, uh, over this you know uh, after about a month from now when we we move into a highly vaccinated population. We'll get them to Jason. Director General, we've got information to suggest that somebody at one of the MIQ uh, facilities in Albany had uh, left the facility. Um, and then came back later in the day, or later um, after a period of being out in the community. Have you got any information? No, I haven't no, any information that one, Jason. We, we, can, we'll, we can follow that up, one up for you, though. Just, I mean, just as a punt, um, the, the, the initial um, case that launched Delta into New Zealand, where are we with that? Have, have you found anything to suggest where that came from? I know it's been a while, or is that trail completely cold now? The trail went cold, and so we uh, obviously focused our resources on managing the outbreak. So we did we did look very hard there, but weren't you know we've got a, a really good idea of we know which hotel it came from, which person, and pretty much which day, but just how it jumped across the the board the border there, as it were, um, is, is and, not been and and that's not uncommon um, that that in these sorts of things we we have a lot of information about it, but in the end the absolute. 100% confirmed link wasn't able to be made. Jo? Um, just on the allied health announcement today, there's been calls for a long time, particularly for people who get uh, regular physio treatment. Um, why has it taken so long to decide that this is safe to do? 
Oh, well, look, the Ministry's been working really closely with the professional bodies, and uh, in many senses it was a clarification of what the uh, what is permitted under Alert Level 3. And uh, early on in, in, uh, in, the, in an outbreak when uh, certainly in Auckland we're trying to um, effectively stamp it out and get back to zero, uh, the controls under Alert Level 4 and the first part of Alert Level 3 were designed to minimise contact between health professionals and um, people as much as possible. Uh, it's now reached a point, and certainly talking with our DHB colleagues up there, that enabling access to some of these allied health services in the community will, will help uh, with any with conditions progressing to a point where they might need hospital care and um, we're, we've also worked out with those professions exactly how they can how they can ensure that they and the people they are treating remain safe last minister um, last week uh, Sam asked you about whether you give any consideration oh. to expediting the proactive release of this public health advice. Have you had any conversations with the Prime Minister or Cabinet colleagues about that? Um, I did, after we, we spoke, um, um, have a conversation upstairs. I'll, I'll have to follow up on what happened with that because I, I wasn't resolved. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Dr McElnay said last week that about 170 to 180 cases was that point where our health system was starting to get a bit of pressure put on it. Do you have any indication where if New Zealand may start to look getting those kind of numbers each day. Is there any modelling to suggest that? I'll, I'll give Dr Bloomfield a chance to, to respond to that, but I was standing here when that happened, and I do think the context is, is important, which is that there's a difference between, in terms of the earlier question, there's a difference between how we manage pressure in the system and whether or not it is manageable. And we do believe that it is manageable, but as we obviously get to a greater number of cases, particularly a greater number of hospitalisations, then hospitals have to start managing their resources. And that is the process that they've been planning for for some time. And this has been, you know, this is common in other situations we've faced in New Zealand when you get a very large outbreak of the flu or you have other reasons why. Hospitals have systems to allow themselves to be able to move resources around. So I think that's what Dr McElnay was referring to, that once you got up to hospitalisations at around a higher level that would be driven by a higher caseload, then hospitals would begin to start moving their resources around. Yeah, two, two comments here. And I... I wasn't on the podium, of course, uh, uh, but I think it was particularly talking about the pressure on the um, uh, contact tracing system. Uh, but it, it, it's safe as it as well to the um, to the healthcare system. At the moment, the R value is still 1.2 to 1.3, which means doubling about every 10 to 12 days. So that means we're likely to reach those case numbers <clears throat> perhaps in two to three weeks' time. What is most important is what proportion of those cases have been vaccinated, because that will be material in terms of how many uh, require hospital care. So there are two things Aucklanders can do to take the pressure off our staff in the hospitals. One is get vaccinated, and two is continue to abide by the Alert Level 3 um, uh, requirements. Just on that, Monday's figure showed about 77% of people weren't vaccinated, including a fair chunk of them with children. Uh, about 50% didn't, weren't vaccinated. Uh, are, you, are you anticipating to see those case numbers have a higher oh. vaccination rate just to try and uh, reduce those hospitalisation levels? Uh, yes, and so actually we just saw um, some uh, modelling from our colleagues in Auckland today showing that uh, over the course of the, the um, outbreak in Auckland, the proportion of cases who are vaccinated is increasing. It's still by far the minority. And so next week we'll give a little bit of a, do a little bit of a show and tell on how, you, how this happens, of course, as you get a highly vaccinated population, the greater the proportion of your cases are, uh, will be vaccinated. Um, but it does absolutely keep down the hospitalisations uh, because they're much less likely to be hospitalised. As I said, only 1.7% of those hospitalised in this outbreak have been fully vaccinated. And, the, and it is, it's a simply a function of maths in many ways that the more people we see vaccinated, the more likely, as an outbreak grows, that you will see people in the outbreak who are vaccinated. But to reiterate Dr Bloomfield's point, both at a personal level, being vaccinated means you're much less likely to get the virus, less likely to be sick with it, and far less likely, as we statistically know, to be hospitalised. And as I said in my introductory comments today, we're now looking at all of those measures in terms of how we measure this particular outbreak. I'll come back to, come down the front and then back up to Jim. Thank you. Sorry, question for uh, Dr Bloomfield. So I think it was yesterday, it was 86 cases 
um, they're isolating at home. Um, can we get an updated number on that and whether, considering Māori and Pacifica are disproportionately harmed by Delta in this outbreak, whether there's any concerns, you know, isolating people at home, considering the virus spread through unvaccinated larger households so far, you know, whether that puts Māori and Pacifica more at risk. Yes, so as of yesterday, I think by the end of the day, it was or actually by the middle of the day, it was 101 people from 55 households who were isolating at home. Uh, there's a both a public health and a clinical risk assessment done before people are, um, uh, are sort of put into that stream, or a low risk um, uh, sort of category of being able to isolate safely at home. And in particular, if people are in households where it's difficult for them to be separate from other household members, then that um, is, a, is almost a directly then they go into, it's a category where they would be uh, supported to go into a, a quarantine facility to avoid that, that what we've otherwise seen is quite a high rate of infection of family members. Yeah. Uh, I said to Gina, didn't I? I've just got a question on behalf of the um, whānau of Sean Wainui. Yeah. They really want some of their family members who are stuck in Auckland to be able to travel down and support um, the rest of the whānau as they grieve. Why is that not allowed? And why are there such prescriptive rules around what constitutes an immediate family member? Look, as you know, this has been one of the hardest things throughout COVID-19, and I've stood here and answered questions about it before, and it, it is a truly difficult uh, area for both those who give us advice about how exemptions are granted and the government in terms of the rules that we set. Um, and, and so throughout this period of time, there have been people who tragically have missed out on attending tangi and, funeral and funerals, and it is very, very hard. The advice that we take, however, is around how we minimise risk. And the thing about funerals, weddings, those sorts of events, is they are one where people find it extremely difficult to socially or physically distance. And so it is a very, very difficult area. I know the Ministry works through to try to find ways to be able to facilitate uh, people there. It is challenged by the concept of tangihanga, because tangihanga implicitly involves a wider group of people. And so that makes it even more challenging, but we, we do know that this is a risk area for us. We try to manage it sensitively, but many, many people have unfortunately had to do that. Do you have anything to add, Dr Winfield? Oh, just that I know our, our team uh, looks at every application on its merit, and, and in fact, uh, we've we've extended the criteria for that sort of family relationship that does allow people to travel out for you know to include not just first degree relatives but where there's fungi type uh, relationships as well and they do uh, look and if people do ask for a review of it and i think there was a request yesterday of that then i, I asked the team to go back and have another look at it in this case it's an, an auntie so have we put too much of a pakeha lens on what constitutes immediate fit? Yeah. Have we not taken a more cultural reference? I believe that the Ministry does take into account cultural factors, but in the end, there will always be a limit to numbers, and that is the issue that we are, that we are dealing and with. And also, just aside from, aside from tangihanga, should there not be, um, I guess, some sympathy given and leniency given where whānau just don't need the support of their wider family, this Young children. Yeah, look, I, again, uh, you know, my heart goes out to, to this whānau and to all of the others who have been through this. It is, without doubt, one of the most difficult areas of managing COVID-19. We try to do it sensitively. We try to do it safely. And I'm sure the Ministry and others would have been assessing any application that way. Ben. Um, do you agree with the, the quite morbid suggestion from Iwi Chair's lead, Mike Smith, who said that it will take Māori deaths to up the vaccination rate, and we did see uh, that, that slightly after the AOG cluster. I don't want to look at it that way. Um, we've seen really good progress in multi vaccination over the last few weeks. We, you know, we've we've come through with significant increases. Um, we are working every single day with every provider we can to make sure that we increase multi vaccination rates. So I don't want to look at it that way. I want to look at it, as I know a lot of Māori do, on the basis of whakapapa, on the basis of how they can support their whānau and their wider community to be able to stay safe. And so I appreciate that there will be people with different views, but that's where I'm coming from. Can I also ask, does the increased case count, um, does it expose the sort of folly of having one of these freedom days, as has been suggested by the opposition for December 1? Well, it certainly, you know, 
it, it, putting yourself in a position where you say there needs to be a certain percentage, but there's also um, a, a so-called Freedom Day seems to me to be a, a somewhat contradictory position. What we need here is to get vaccination rates as high as we possibly can across as many parts of our community as we possibly can. And you know, I you know, everybody would love it if you could set a date with COVID that everything would be over, but that simply isn't how the virus works. I understand the frustration that sits behind that, but actually the strong advice we've had is it's about vaccination rates. I'll come to Jason, and just before I do, I can say that I got a message to say there's no truth to that rumour, and in there, in fact, no MIQ facilities in Albany. Oh, yeah, makes sense. <laughs> um, Have a question. Just on, um, is the decision for Cabinet tomorrow still around the Waikato? Is that still in the agenda? So the advice we'll get, the public health risk assessment that we'll get from um, the Ministry of Health is likely to come through later this afternoon, and so ministers will attempt to assess that as quickly as we can so that we can give certainty to the people of Waikato as soon as we can. Yeah. Um, we're likely to try and announce that possibly this afternoon. That won't mean another press conference, just to reassure you of that. Um, it will be likely done by a media release as soon as we get the information. It's just there's a timing issue. Um, Dr Bloomfield and his team provide their advice and then it works its way through to us as ministers. So we are conscious of the fact that people in the Waikato will want certainty, in which case we'll try to do it this evening. Is there going to be a, a cabinet meeting or is it just... Um, there's a group of cabinet ministers who are given power to act on these matters and we can meet in a number of forms. We meet virtually, we meet um, in person, so we'll be able to manage that. Minister, we'll go to Henry, he hasn't had a question. Minister, um, are you, uh, have you seen the news about the warehouse? It's clear that a number of businesses have been working their way through this and, and working out both their legal obligations but also um, assessing the health and safety of their workforce and of their customers. If you go on the WorkSafe website today, you'll find a risk assessment tool that you can use as, a, as an employer uh, as to whether or not you should be vaccinating or your staff should be vaccinating. A big part of that risk assessment tool is about public facing and, the, and the, the fact that if you are in that position, that would justify, from a health and safety perspective, you deciding that you wanted all of your staff to be vaccinated. In terms of the broader issue, work's been going on between government ministers, uh, business groups and unions to discuss uh, how we will move forward from here to provide the maximum amount of certainty that we can. I think everyone will appreciate it's a relatively new area for employment law, and so people are treating carefully, but that work is progressing. In the meantime, as I say, there is actually a risk assessment tool, and I'm, I'm not going to comment specifically on the warehouse, but certainly where you have a lot of public-facing staff you can you can look at that tool and see that from a health and safety perspective, you're likely to want to have vaccinated staff. I feel that that will drive the vaccine rate up because after Super Saturday, we've seen three days with 10k first doses and about 32k second doses, which is one of the, you know the last week we've had basically since August. Um, looks like things are dropping off. Yeah, well, obviously, and you know, as we get to higher rates of vaccination, we get to people who are perhaps more hesitant or harder for us to reach, and so it's not it's not a huge surprise in the absence of a major effort like Super Saturday that it will sit around there. We are now applying all the resources we can to reaching those people. To answer the first part of your question, um, I welcome anything that lifts vaccination rates. I think more people talking about the importance of it not just from the health and safety of you individually, but the people you work with, the community that you're around, is a good thing. Do you, do you, do you, do you, do you um, do you have people that are business owners who are asking for a door check? Yeah. But as I say, they don't want to be in court. And currently, obviously, there's this, there's this risk assessment tool, but that seems like it could be challenging. Yeah, look, I, you know, these are, whenever you get into matters of employment law, anything potentially becomes challengeable, and I have no doubt at some point there will be legal cases in this area around the world, you can see them um, happening. The work that ministers are doing is to give as much clarity as we can. We are very aware of those employers who are telling us, please just mandate this. We've also got ones who don't want that as well. And so we have to make sure that we have a, a legal framework that is robust. Um, discussions about that are happening, and I'm sure there'll be more to say soon. Jane. Do you think legislation would be a step too far? I mean, National on its plan said that, uh, you know, if legislation was necessary to give that certainty to businesses, then that's what they would do. 
do you not think that's necessary, or do you just not want to put it into the statute books and have it, you know, um, in that kind of form? As I said in my, in my answer I just gave to Henry, uh, it, this is evolving and evolving quickly, and you can look around the world at, at examples um, that, that, that have gone either way. Uh, what I think the most important thing is certainty. Now, if certainty can be delivered by legislation, that's one thing. If there are other ways of doing it, we should look at that as well. We do need both employers and employees to be able to come along with this. And if we, I know, you know, we're in the middle of this now, but if we all took a step backwards and, and just for a moment considered that, that that's the kind of employment law change we would be considering, it, it's, it's a big step. We're in the middle of a pandemic. Big steps are things that we've had to do, but we just have to make sure we work through so we don't put ourselves in the position that Henry just mentioned of being in court. Yeah, I mean, the government's potentially in, in the gun as well, isn't it, in terms Correct. of legal testing? Is there anything on the horizon you know, that could be the test case for it? There must be well, we're certainly not looking to take the case. No. Um, but, but look, I, I mean, again, yeah. the only reason I mentioned that is because if you look around the world, that's what's happened, and so um, I would not be at all surprised. But we are working through that process. Um, I do welcome as many people as possible being vaccinated, and obviously, as I say, right now, people could take a look at that risk assessment tool and make a, a pretty good judgment. Challenges against government I'm not aware of anything well. right now today, no. Uh, Derek? I just want to clarify, so there might be a decision on Waikato's alert level setting today, like this afternoon. Potentially. All I'm, all, the only reason I say that is because we want to make sure we give people in the Waikato as much... Um, notice as possible, and I think Prime Minister said on Monday it was going to come on Friday. That's right. It's because the public health advice gets delivered today, and um, we don't want to delay. I, we sometimes get criticised in this room if we sit on a decision for a short length of time. And so, ministers, when we were briefly discussing matters that earlier this morning, concluded that if the Director General provided his advice to us today, and we could make a decision today, then we should do that. I wanted to ask the, 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 the worker who went to the Hawke's Bay, who later tested positive, um, do you know their vaccination status? Uh, I don't, uh, and it was uh, a person who it was a permitted activity related to childcare arrangements. Uh, I don't know about their vaccination status, but just to reiterate that um, they had returned back to the Waikato before they became uh, a, a case. Uh, I do know that one of the two contacts in, in the Hawke's Bay was fully vaccinated, but as I said, both of those people have returned negative. Day six tests. Any more thought to mandatory vaccination for people leaving the boundary? Uh, not lately. I mean, it's an ongoing process and we never rule out um, the idea that we may go there. Um, we continue to listen to the advice we get. I'm conscious of our time, so I'm just going to take a couple more. Joe, here and here. Does it, you're talking about the ongoing need for the, the difficult ones to now get vaccinated. Does it bother you that in South Taranaki, for example, there has been a um, plea from Iwe who run Māori Health Services there for a caravan-type style um, from Taranaki DHB for a number of months now and they finally got granted it yesterday because Māori vaccination became such a talking point and Minister Henare called out Taranaki DHB for being slack. Why does it take that sort of comment to prompt DHBs to actually deliver the services that Māori providers who know what they're doing on the ground actually need? So I can't comment specifically on the Taranaki DHB in this instance. Um, what I do know is that we've got really good examples around the country where we've seen tremendous collaboration between DHB, iwi and other Māori health providers, and we do have examples, as you note, that Minister Henare called out, where we don't. Um, our job right now is to make sure that we work with every single provider who can and help us lift those vaccination rates. I absolutely respect that there are Māori health providers around New Zealand who know their community well, and they know their community in many ways a lot better than perhaps some of the people in the DHB do. We have to listen to them, but this won't work unless we're collaborating. The DHBs are vital cogs in this. They're under a lot of pressure, they're working very, very hard, but we can share the burden of that, and so I'm pleased that they've responded to Minister Hinale's call. Dr Blanco, just on that, have, have you been involved in that at all? I mean, the issues have been raised with you here many times, most of the time from me when it comes to Taranaki. Um, have you talked to the DHB? Has that prompted them to actually deliver these services or what? Uh, well, I don't personally talk to the DHBs regularly, but my team does because they meet convene the senior responsible officers from all the DHBs uh, more than once a week. I spoke yesterday actually with the, the CE of um, Taranaki, but that was after the decision had been taken, to say what else do you need from us that would help you 
uh, in your efforts there, and I was uh, reassured by the the um, uh, what what I was told around the what it what it had improved in terms of the working with and the relationships with the range of EWI providers there. So I know that's a real focus for them. I also had a conversation with the chief executive tied RFT yesterday. I'm just going to because of the time, I'm just going to take two more here and here. Dr Bloomfield, when will the border order be updated to recognise other vaccines for border workers such as the New Zealand pilots? Uh, I don't know exactly, but we'll come back to you on that. It's, it's very close to being completed. And Sano Order is claiming the Ministry of Health has delayed court proceedings in order to build their case. Why did you offer a proposal that was not the data set they'd asked for? Uh, well, uh, I'm not going to comment on yeah. that because it's a, 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 I think, a, a I think process that's going to be... Before. May still be before the court, so I think we might just leave that one. We'll take the final one here. Um, thank you. Just on uh, travel documents, um, so has anything been done to tighten up the process after obviously those two women travelled out of, um, you know, brought, brought COVID to Northland? Has anything been done to tighten up? So I, th I think I believe I might, have, I might have said it on the podium. So we went back and worked with MB in particular around how those business travel permits are, are granted. Um, they, they are a process, a thorough process now of checking within particular categories as well. Uh, there was an element, as we know, of, of error, human error in, in what happened there. So processes and systems get constantly checked. Um, I think I've said it a number of times before that, you know, with the numbers of people who are moving, it, it is very tough. But each each day, I know that there is a group of people working really, really hard to make sure that they help keep New Zealanders safe by working through that permitting system. Um, every now and then there'll be a mistake. As soon as it happens, we correct it. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>